Um, I'd like to welcome um, the first PILAR talk which puts together two different departments. So I'm very pleased to welcome Steve, Dr. Steve uh, Foster to our pedagogical uh, applied research group in languages and literature because he's been working with one of our stars of creative writing, the star of creative style of writing, Alison Morris, who um, has worked with Steve on very interesting things. I don't want to say what, that will spoil it for you. I am Marina Orsini Jones. Um, I, I like the PILAG to be a university wide initiative. I'm pleased to see that some people here who are from the university. I'm very honoured to have our director of in you now, International Pedagogical e Learning. Learning and teaching for the faculty, Paul Cashin. Uh, can I just ask perhaps everybody just to say briefly who they are because I don't think we know each other. So just uh, who you are and what department you're from very briefly. So Marina, Department of English and Languages. Um, Alison Morris, Department of English and Languages, Creative Writing. Steve Foster from Law. Sheena Gardner, Head of the Department of English and Languages. Marcus Liu from Law and the Language. Well, Richard Yuan from uh, Cardiff University, a visiting scholar there. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dong Mei Chen, I'm from China, a visiting scholar in the Department of Language. Thank you. Libric Language Centre Manager. Paul Fashion, the two previously. Well, I'm the Department of English and Languages, I teach French. Uh, I'm Richard from the Economic Finance Council. Good. Hello, I'm Mila Lopez Villas Casillas, the Department of English and Languages. I'm the Department of Education Management. I'm Juan Antonio Caldero, Department of English and Languages. Okay, so thank you everybody. And uh, just a brief uh, say something about the PIL This is our penultimate talk of the year. Uh, the next talk is Alison again, so if you like it today, you might want to have more next time. Mm -hmm. And Alison will talk, in fact, with Tim, who is recording us today kindly, because Dean Buckland could not be here with, the, with us today to record. And uh, Tim and Alison, on the 3rd of June, will talk about blogging, collaboration, presentation, and engagement, in case you're interested in coming to that talk as well. well without much further ado, I think I'll leave it to Alison and Steve. Okay. So, I go. Okay, thank you very much for attending today. Um, uh, as I said before, I'm Alison Morris and I'm a um, senior lecturer and uh, course director for BA English and Creative Writing, which is a new degree started in October. And, um, and this is uh, Dr. Steve Foster who I have been um, liaising with in the last few years over a project um, to use the short story um, with law students as an assessment tool. Um, I'm just going to flick, because we have our little introduction to ourselves here, and so that's me. And Steve, how old is that photo? Yeah, and it's staying as well. <laughs> as long as I stay at the university, that photo's staying. It's 2003, but I've hardly changed. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'll do is I'll just give you a little introduction to our project and uh, how it actually got started. Um, it was a, a little fear of mine a few years ago about um, government cuts and the drive towards more vocational subjects. And so I wanted to uh, have a look at creative writing and its role in higher education. Um, so I did a bit of research to see what other people were doing and not many institutions in the UK are doing much at all with creative writing across the disciplines. Um, and in fact, still there aren't that many uh, BA creative writing degrees. Um, I looked further afield then and America and Australian universities are using creative writing as a learning tool. Um, so I thought across the disciplines so I thought, okay, well, maybe we need to do that here. 
um, and I did find some details from um, Adina Davis, who is um, uh, who teaches law in America, and I have a quote from her. I'll just read it out because I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, it's here. Okay, now she um, wrote a, a journal article on Tell Me a Story Using Short Fiction in Teaching Law and Bioethics. She said, for some years now I have been experimenting with the use of short fiction in my upper level class on biomedical ethics and the law. Biomedical ethics is a subject nourished by stories. One can almost chart the course of legal progress in bioethics by invoking the names of the leading characters. It is these people and their problems and the often conflicting wishes of the people who love and care for them that capture the student's imagination. Okay, so I thought, law, the law department. Um, the reason that I started this was because I've been teaching creative writing here for a number of years. I used short fiction with the year two students and um, some of those students are doing English and joints and one student in particular wrote a story um, to do with her history link and she was doing English and history. And she said to me that she learnt far more about her subject area through writing her short story about um, the First World War and um, being her main character was in the trenches and she called it broken lungs and she found that living through this person became gave her more of an awareness of history so I thought okay this is important um, so I, a little bird told me that Steve Foster actually wrote a bit of fiction himself so I went and approached Steve so Steve's going to um, have a chat to you about what happened from there well from my biopic you could see that I concentrate primarily on human rights and, and prisoners rights law but uh, I also run um, an academic writing course to the first year lawyers and have written a book how to write better law essays which is now uh, quite a big market in in secondary and higher education because a lot of students find it very difficult to articulate both orally and particularly on paper and writing essays etc so in one sense it was quite natural that, that Alison should come to me to put forward this particular proposal uh, in the sense that I, I deal with academic writing as well as the substantive law. Um, but apart from that I couldn't quite see the connection and I couldn't see, quite see how it was going to work and my initial reaction was I'm just going to have to ask my head of department whether this is okay because the proposal was to um, use this short story as an assessment and obviously it's um, you know assessments are fairly formal and they're moderated and we've got externals etc making sure that legal standards are being set so I think the main difficulty was how we were going to fit the short story into, into an assessment and test the sorts of skills that we were hoping to test and on Alison's part is we want to get students to thinking thinking outside the box and thinking about how they express themselves etc but my main concern I was being fairly formal was how I was going to assess the law uh, through through a short story um, I then started thinking well law is is perfect for a short story because most most law not all law but most law is taught through cases and case case precedents uh, there's obviously a lot of statutory material as well, but almost every legal aspect, every legal area is involved in teaching the law through cases. And, and as an English lawyer, we're, we are obsessed with precedent and following particular precedent, etc. And I thought, well, these cases, in fact, are stories because the cases are brought by real people who have real um, uh, circumstances happening to them and that affects all sorts of people, the people who bring the case, the people who have to defend the case, the, 
the solicitors, the barristers, the judges, the public, the press, the relatives, etc. So um, I started to think, yeah, that this is actually going to work uh, in the sense that they can write a short story but at the same time show off their legal expertise. Now what we originally did uh, was to say that the short story must include um, an account of the legal case because what I was mainly concerned about is that a student might come along and say yes I can think up a, a story uh, and I'll write you a story but I'm not going to show you any legal knowledge or any legal skills at all so what we said was that the case that the story must be based on a case it must be based on a human rights case which has been decided in the courts but more importantly uh, it must include in the story some account of the law so that within that 1750 words you not only explain why you chose this case but you write a story about a case but include within that story some account of the law and you can decide um, how you do that now I gave one example uh, which is up there the John Terry and the private privacy shock horror case which was about uh, a privacy case brought by or privacy defamation case brought by John Terry in 2010 just when the England were preparing to go to the World Cup um, and that, that story was obviously based on the legal case which John Terry lost trying to protect his identity in a privacy case but it was based around um, a solicitor's office the, the story was based in the solicitor's office where he's brought into the solicitor's office and told that he's lost his case and it was a humorous account of that now, Alison wrote uh, a, a story called The Right Charlie which was based on a case brought by Princess, Prince, Prince Charles uh, against Associated Newspapers when they were publishing his private diaries. So they were both humorous accounts uh, and what we attempted to do, both, both of us attempted to do, perhaps Alison less so because she was not a lawyer, was that we attempted to include the law within that particular story. So within my story I had the solicitor explaining to, um, to John Terry the outcome of the case. Uh, and in one, in one situation uh, the solicitor says that you can't win just because your privacy is interfered with per se and John Terry thinks that he's been called Percy and there's some confusion about per se and per, Percy etc. But what, we had, what I attempted to do is to give them an illustration of how you could include the, the law and the legal aspects within the story itself that worked quite well to get them going because they were a bit skeptical about how they how they could put this thing together um, so that style of including the law in the story was was a good way of getting them going S since uh, that's well, that's two years ago and we've had three sets of students who've written the short story since that but what we found very soon was that the inclusion of the law within the story was breaking the thread of the story. Uh, it was becoming rather con uh, contrived. So suddenly this story would be bouncing along quite nicely with quite nice narrative etc and then suddenly a judge would appear with this very formal language yes. uh, about how the law, you know, how the case was decided etc and it ruined the story uh, in, in, that, in that sense. Uh, and it needed quite a lot of skill on behalf of the student to, to in, introduce the law in a, in, a, in a more subtle way. So what I've done in, 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 in future years was that I said pick a case, uh, so choose a case, write a story about it from any particular angle and then separately in 250 words give me a legal account of the case uh, so that you, we can see that you've actually read the case uh, in, in that second part. Just to put it into context, what we normally do with human rights is that we give them a, a formal piece of coursework, which could be an essay, why was the Human Rights Act passed and should it be reformed, etc. Or it could be a case note, write a, case, uh, write a note about a particular case uh, saying what the facts were in the decision and the, the legal analysis, etc. Or it could be a problem type question, 
So you give a hypothetical problem question and ex ask them to explain and apply the law to that particular situation. So that's the context in which they are operating. That's what they were used to. The third year students were used to either an essay question or a problem question or a formal case note, etc. And getting them to, uh, to jump on board this, I thought was going to be very difficult. We, we had in that year, I think, about 50 students. Mm. And I guessed about five or 10 would jump on board and be interested at all. In the end, we had almost half of the students mm. who wanted to, to write uh, a story. Um, so we had to go about persuading them to do it and persuading them that this was actually going to work. Uh, there was a promise of publication, so the most direct mm -hmm. inducement was the promise of publication. We publish every year uh, a volume of the law journal uh, and a special issue which includes their stories. And they like this idea very much, the idea that they might end up being published, etc. So that was a, uh, a good inducement. Uh, and then, obviously, um, Alison's got her commentary yes. words, and we had a, a promise that uh, the best story would, would end up in, in, that, uh, in that publication as well. Um, but I think we untapped an enthusiasm from the students, which we didn't really expect, no. well, I didn't expect to be there. Um, they were very interested in, in, in the general idea but very concerned about how they would go about it and most importantly whether it's going to affect their marks if they were going to muck the danger of mucking up uh, and not doing the right doing the right thing etc so that that's how we introduced it to the students yeah yeah and i offered them a session um, for about an hour um, those students who were interested and um, so they came along and, uh, uh, you know, they were a little bit um, worried at the fact that they had to produce this story, but, um, but they were very enthusiastic about it. Um, I gave them some examples of short stories that were vaguely related to the law, and of course they had our um, stories as well that we created specially for it. Um, but I did say to them, it's not about the story or the story writing or about creative writing. It's about your understanding of what's going on in that situation. So they had some examples and I spoke to them about um, you know, story writing, but they all read stories, They've all, they all read books. And they, so, you know, they kind of knew what was expected of them. But I did alert them to the fact that um, they needed the five elements there of a short story. And what was interesting was they already had four of them in the case studies that they were going to choose. And uh, the five elements being um, character, conflict, setting, and theme, of course those are there in the case studies. What was missing was the plot. And so they had to create the scenario where, you know, maybe um, at the breakfast table that morning and the conversation between the, uh, 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 the people, uh, their families, and, and also a little mock-up of a court case, perhaps, and what happens afterwards. So all that could be made up. Um, so we asked them to have a go, and they sent me a list of a sort of plot line um, and then uh, Steve and I had a look at their first drafts of the stories and um, we, were, we just engaged in such um, lively conversations with them and such enthusiasm and such motivation that they were doing this, um, producing a story. Uh, the keenness actually was, um, was catching. I have a few comments from the students here. Um, one student said, I had to go a little further than my typical research. I had to go inside the head of the participant in a case to convey the message through my story and construct my plot. 
Why does the defendant believe he has such a right and why is it so important to him? I discovered a new aspect to the law, a less impersonal characterization of it. I was given the opportunity to be a shadow claimant, defendant, judge and bystander. Um, we had all sorts of um, all sorts of cases that they looked at. There was euthanasia. Yeah, uh, it had to be a human rights case. Yes. Um, which lend themselves very well to, to stories because they're uh, they're topical, they're they're interesting, and they affect human beings. So there were lots of cases about privacy um, cases brought by celebrities. Uh, the there was and there still is an ongoing debate about euthanasia so there were cases about euthanasia there were transsexual rights and homosexual rights cases prisoners being detained um, foreign suspects being detained etc so all of them had the, the necessary ingredients yes. of being an exciting story the main dif the main concerns that we might have are firstly that they would simply copy our examples so that they would all be set in a solicitor's office or they would all be based in Buckingham Palace or whatever. Uh, and Clarence uh, House. Clarence so House. So that uh, we, were concerned, we were concerned about that. We were also concerned that they would simply relate the story of the case so that people would say today we were appearing in court and there was a judge etc etc mm. now what they needed to do was to step outside that particular box and put themselves in the position of the protagonist or a number of protagonists and they were very good at doing that yes subsequently when we've introduced it to the first years they're they're less adventurous and we do very often get students simply giving us a rather dull account of the legal proceedings uh, but the third years were, were ready for it they as you <coughs> say they had all those ingredients and that they were ready to do it yes I think um, there's a, a key figure in creative writing in this country is um, Graham Harper and uh, I've read a number of his books now uh, it, he, he writes books on teaching creative writing uh, he also um, is an author as well um, but he wrote something that I thought was very interesting to do with this particular project we were doing with the law students um, he says a creative piece constructs for the reader and the writer a hypothesis a what if what if is the question that drives the process of creative writing and the reception of its results e.g. what if this was my life what if I had this opportunity or what if this disaster happened to me assessment right. the assessment process was that um, Alice and I put together some sort of uh, criteria mm. but they had to write a short story of 1750 words about a case which had actually been decided so very often they want to write about a case which has been reported in the news an arrest etc but which hasn't gone to a court of law now that make that sort of scenario makes for a good story um, you know an arrest for particular offense etc but wouldn't do for this module because we wanted to assess their ability to understand the case itself so they had to choose a case which had been decided either by um, a British court or it could be an international court a European court or a foreign court so a lot of our um, overseas students said well can I do a case which has been decided by the Belgian court and as long as there was evidence that it had been uh, reported uh, they could do that they had to construct a story and they were ba being based uh, their assessment and their marks were, were assessed on that um, but as I say they had to include legal material so they were going to be assessed on their knowledge of that particular case and what that what the judge decided in that particular case so as I say initially they had to include some of the legal material in in uh, in the story itself the observations, I suppose, are related to 
what I hoped to get out of it because I had to show to my head of department and and I think to the legal world generally that this was providing not just an opportunity for them to to tell a story to play, uh, to play uh, but uh, that it was enhancing their legal skills. The observations I think were three or fourfold. I mean firstly I noticed it, it, incredible enhancement of their writing skills um, and their attention to detail in grammar and structure of <coughs> sentences which usually they don't care about at all a lot of them don't care about they say as long as I get the law down you can decipher what I'm trying to say they were very very keen uh, on revising their work on checking it the spelling and, and grammar was was generally very good um, they were also very good at putting the, the story together. You could see that they were enjoying the story. And you could see that they'd thought about the structure and the plot and how the essay start, how the, the story started and how it finished. They put a lot of effort into that. And very often they don't do that again with, with the structure of a, of a law essay. It's very difficult without turning it on its head to see where it starts and where it finishes. And, and what the main bits are in, in between. So the structure uh, had improved greatly. What about the, what I was obviously concerned with is have they learnt any law? Mm. Well, what we did notice is that perhaps for the first time in their law studies they read a case, they read a law report and they read it very thoroughly. They had to read that law report to get the facts, to get the characters, to get what happened, etc. And with that inducement, of, co of course, that they've got to include the, the law within that particular story. So they they read uh, law reports. They seem to under they seem to have enjoyed reading the law report, which we'd never come across uh, before, because <laughs> they don't tend to enjoy reading thirty page law reports. But they actually understood what the case was about and why it had been brought and what in at least what impact it had on the on the individuals the judgment they also had to they also i think picked up the idea that yes this case has a relevance to the study of human rights they could put it in the context of uh, of their study of human rights so the, you know, those were the, the main observations the end result is that the coursework marks in, increased um, they were very much improved from previous years. Um, we tended to find that those who'd done the short story were getting better marks than those people who chose the traditional title because they weren't forced to do the short story. They, they had an option. And that had a, quite a, a, an interesting knock-on effect because in the, the next year, 70 or 80 percent of people were doing the, the short story instead of the traditional piece because it had gone through the the grapevine that you can get a good mark by writing a short story um, and that and, and that simply was the case um, that, that the marks did improve uh, to, to such an extent that I think we almost got an average mark of 60 for coursework marks which is uh, which is quite a lot for law you know we, we usually even in the third year around the, around the 50 because so uh, we've got such a, a, a variation but it didn't stop there in the sense that the exam results in, in improved as well. Um, that not only did they benefit from this exercise in terms of their coursework results, the skills that they that they discovered and the knowledge that they discovered in the storytelling exercise filtered through to the exams as well. Whether that was greater engagement with the subject, um, the had an opportunity to look at a case, etc., at a very early stage and actually read it properly. Um, whether that was the case, that's that's what happened. They were getting better marks in the coursework um, and and in the examination results. We've continued the um, the scheme. The results in human rights are are in continuing to to increase and, and, and get better. Um, Although we've just had semesterization, so it's, it's difficult to see what impact semesters had, not only on this process, but on, on results generally. Yeah. Mm. Did you, you mentioned to me that they didn't have much time on the stories? Well, with the semester system, we've no, 
because now I have to teach the human rights in the second second semester, uh, and I meet them in the first week. I give them the essay title and including the opportunity to write a short story, and they've got to do that within six weeks because they're going to submit within six weeks. What we did find this year, therefore, is less percentage of students took up the short story option uh, because I think they felt that it was going to require more reading, harder work, etc., or enjoyable but more harder work. Um, so there were less students doing it, and I did notice the quality, not necessarily of the stories, but of the editing to have gone down, the time for editing. We've, I noticed um, they weren't paying attention to that amount of detail in, in terms of e editing and getting the piece perfect, because in the past it had been their baby. They'd, they'd actually looked after this thing and said, it's got to be pristine when I present it to uh, to the assessor, etc., and we're getting less of that. Not necessarily because they're less motivated, but because of less time. So that is going to be a concern for the future. Okay. Um, there is one particular story that we're we're going to mention. Yeah. Um, the one student who was just um, marvelous in his enthusiasm. And uh, I, I particularly like the fact that he used a metaphor throughout his story. And the case was um, about Michael Douglas um, uh, and Catherine Zeta-Jones yeah. versus Hello Magazine. Hello Magazine, yeah. The, the background was that during their wedding they'd invited a, um, a rival magazine, uh, OK Magazine, to take the photographs. Um, and. Hello Magazine had sneaked in there and taken some photographs of Catherine Zeta Jones shoveling down some Christmas cake, which she didn't like that photograph at all, as you'd expect. And they sued um, Hello Magazine for breach of confidentiality and privacy um, in the courts, and it had to be decided whether that was in the public interest and whether they had an expectation of privacy. And um, this student took up the story from there. Yes, um, he used the metaphor cheese because he thought um, that Michael Douglas was rather cheesy. <laughs> so when um, there was a scenario, uh, the story started in the Douglas's mansion and um, he liked to, to play around with Catherine Zeta Jones's obsession with Antonio Banderas. Banderas. And so there were large inflatable Zorros everywhere in the mat, especially in the swimming pool. And, um, and the cheese comes in where Michael Douglas, when they're in the courtroom, um, Catherine I think is crying yeah. throughout, um, but Michael Douglas falls asleep because he's eaten too much cheese and of course cheese brings on a dream. And so he's dreaming this scenario in the court, which is actually, he bring, this is where he brings the law into, or his understanding of the law into this dream about mice and Roquefort cheese and heaven knows what else. And I think he called it Say Cheesy. I wanted him to call it Say Cheese because a lot of it is to do with the photography and this imposition and the privacy law um, and, and the fact that Michael Douglas is cheesy but he, he insisted on calling it. Um, and if you think it was a bizarre story, cheesy. it was. Uh, <laughs> um, until we did some editing, it was, it was even more bizarre at first <laughs> and uh, I think the students who read it just couldn't get their heads around it. And no. I couldn't get my head around it for the first and I had about four meetings with him to, on, on the couch just to say, what, the what's this about? <laughs> uh, and, but once I'd cracked it, it was a, it was a fascinating story. Oh, yes. And, and in fact, reading it again, yes. um, it's very clever. Yes. It's very clever indeed. Yes. And some of the characters are, are mice uh, within the, the woodwork of the, uh, the judge's bench, etc. So if you thought it was weird, it is. Yeah, it is very weird. <laughs> I, I have a quote from him. He said that he found writing a story instead of a case study exposed him to researching and acknowledging spicy details generally considered trivial by law aficionados and normally overlooked by students in their reading. 
Um, he said, I am grateful for having this experience. Um, so, of course, that was lovely, and his spicy detail, I think, was mostly to do with the inflatable Zorros yeah. in there, and uh, uh, cheesy Michael Douglas. Um, so, uh, a short while ago, Marina um, discussed with me uh, threshold concepts, and I thought, well, you know, our project that we've been doing, um, it's become such a powerful medium for these law students to, um, to take on some difficult concepts um, and actually understand them better through becoming um, characters in these case studies, through these perspectives. So we thought that was interesting. Um, the enthusiasm and commitment, of course, was very important. Um, the fact that they were so enthusiastic um, gave them this ownership over a story and this is something that they were very proud of and I think that's really how they became, um, we found that their grammar had improved mm. and that they, they checked their work over and over again, you know, to make it as perfect as they could. Um, I have a quote here from Marina. Um, in order to help students to cross threshold concepts, it is necessary to devise student-centered activities, and we thought that that really was mm. uh, at the heart of what we were doing, um, that allow them to engage both in individual and collective reflection on the troublesome knowledge encountered in this sort of concept of the law, uh, we felt. Um, there is um, there's a lady called Jenny Moon in this country who works at Bournemouth University who's written several books about storytelling. Uh, she says that the use of stories in higher education enhances thinking and learning. And I think this is important mm. for us to, to take forward really um, with this type of um, experiment. So our conclusion. <laughs> marking is fun, it is much, <laughs> much better than marking traditional courses, although you have to close mark um, because you, you don't know what they're going to write. With a, a normal law essay, once they start on a particular point, you know what's coming next or you hope what's coming <coughs> next uh, is right. You're not sure what they're going to write and of course no. it's got to flow so it, it, you have to close mark it. Uh, we continue with the publications. Um, we, we publish a, a volume of short stories every, every year. Um, there are challenges with semesterization, and I'm concerned that perhaps particularly first years uh, and, and the third years who are having to do a module in a whole term, whether they will, uh, whether they'll jump on board and do the, do the story uh, writing exercise, or whether they would go for something more formal and perhaps uh, easier to do within the time limit, etc. But we've, in the law department, well particularly in my module, I've found that it's not just opened their minds, but it has improved their grammar skills and the structure of their answers, because they do start thinking, I've got to put this in order because the reader simply won't understand what, the, what it's all about. And I spoke to a student um, a few weeks ago and she was doing a story and she was very proud of herself because she said I showed this to I showed this uh, story to my housemate who was doing engineering or something uh, and it was about a mother whose daughter had died uh, suicide etc and my housemate cried and she was very proud of the fact that she'd made her housemate cry but I think the real pride was it must have been pretty moving and you yes. know quite effective to do that um, and they often say to me do you do you often shed a tear I said I've shed lots of tears over over coursework over the years <laughs> but yeah sometimes it, it, it does actually hit you yeah that's quite that's quite emotional and uh, I think if, if that's all we achieve you know through few students and then, then it's all worth it um. Really, I think we've got a few things that we could take forward and we could certainly have a look at how creative writing, um, this sort of project, can help with grammar or improve grammar and how it might increase 
Marx in some ways because of this ownership over a, a piece of material. Um, so I think we need to have a look into that and maybe I can work with Marina on um, threshold concepts as well because I think it's a very interesting um, approach using creative writing. I'm very happy to say that there is an A-level in creative writing starting in September in the, uh, this year so I'm very pleased about that and I think you know from this particular experience I have seen that there, yes there is definitely a place for creative writing in higher education and I hope that um, we can get some more people on board across the um, different subject areas as well um, and so I'd like to thank Steve for getting involved and to continue with it yeah. as well which is great I, I, di I didn't realize I thought maybe it would be a one-off um, but um, Steve's just taken it up and uh, with gusto mm -hmm. along with the students and um, so the third years and the first, and the first years. So we've got about 80 involved. story writers every year which is, which is great. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so because I like uh, threshold concepts, I mean you've given me food for thought actually because you know how acquainted you are with threshold concept of literature and education and this idea that students oscillate with very big concepts and I think in your case it was a case study which what they were struggling with. You had to crack that nut that they didn't understand what a case study was, mm -hmm. how to analyze a case, case study and that's mm -hmm. how you thought about this filter. But I'm thinking now what you just said, semesterization, because mm -hmm. cracking a threshold concept is a very long process and you already said mm -hmm. that there have been differences. Mm -hmm. And whether it is bad to, you know, to ask students to cross a lot of threshold concepts or concepts which are so major in a short, in a a short time. So perhaps we should actually analyse how the whole concept of threshold concept can be affected by the introduction mm. of semesterization, mm. Because really compacting something which requires time yes. cannot be good sometimes. So, you know, although semesterization is a brilliant idea, Paul, we all like it well, very I've much. Got an <laughs> 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 it does, does emphasise the need to think in terms of courses or other modules. Yeah, I know, but even in a course, you can have you can have long thin courses where students have got time to think. But you know, that's I don't want to, to go there. Um, but you know, it's very fascinating, and I'm thinking now whether we should actually look at the impact that semesterization has had in the digestion of what we feel are the threshold concepts, whether they are okay. case studies in law, transitivity in, uh, in linguistics, mm. critical literary criticism in literature, Marxism, feminism, or the other when you talk about uh, otherness in Hispanic um, world. And so, you know, quite interesting, mm. be interesting to see. Can I ask you, have you interviewed the students to find out if their perception of improvement was also felt by them or, or do you have not time to, to interview Yeah, quotes, I mean, I have got some quotes where they say that they, um, one student said that she'd learnt things in fine-tuned detail okay. about, about this, um, using cre uh, the short story. Um, so, uh, and other quotes do say that they have the better understanding of, of human rights. Um, so, so yes. So there, there is but this perception they're actually doing better. They're yes, better I mean we can them. certainly do some more of that mm. with mm. the with the students now that they they're using them in semester mm. time. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah sorry, I don't want to ask all the questions. Yeah. Very <laughs> <interesting>. <laughs> how, how about yes, have they Holland. applied those skills into other modules as well? Has it made them look at cases in other modules in a different? I expect it would with with the third years. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that once they've um, broken that barrier and said, right, I'll read a, case, read a case for human rights, they might not be quite so reluctant when they have to do it for land or, or whatever, but I haven't done any uh, research into that or even asked uh, members of staff, do you find that their case analyses are better now that they are actually reading cases? I suspect that they wouldn't, that there wouldn't be that sort of broad um, improvement in that area. But um, getting them to read a case in the first year, I think, has been welcomed by the, uh, mm. by the first year tutors because they're saying, yes, and my module does run in the first, first semester, so getting them to do that as early as possible can only be a good thing. 
Yes, Jay. Oh, thank you. That was really useful, especially because uh, in journalism I, I do the kind of story writing from the factual side rather than the fiction side. And I was thinking, because I teach media law, so I, you know, especially it's Article 8, and it's given this kind of push pull relationship with Article 10, which is um, part of the European Convention on Human Rights, we're familiar with the details, but it's a big celebrity mm. vehicle to try and mm. argue uh, for more privacy injunctions. Um, and, and it's always very difficult when I'm trying to explain to my students um, you know, the relevance and how to use it and how to make it make sense to them. Mm. So this kind of story writing, we go off to court and they write factual stories, so yeah. they actually do do the shock horror, yes. kind of news of screws yes. type stories. Um, but it, but, it, but it's very much them on the outside, on the ceiling, looking down. There's not yeah. that sort of emotional involvement. No. And, you know, which is the real scrutiny, deciding which angle you're going to be. You're going to be the victim, you're going to be yes. the perpetrator, you're going to be the judge, the jury, yes. whatever. But and I was also thinking about the cross-collaboration. As a, as a learning tool for the students, if you collaborated with some of the short stories you have and turned them into, into scripts, and had the performing arts students mm. perform it, and you videoed it, you could have a series mm. of law, mm. um, a series of dramas to mm. teach <coughs> students across, yeah. you know, who are doing UK law and yeah. martial law, to teach them as a kind of innovative Yeah, because most of the mm. stories have got quite a lot of dialogue in. Yeah, mm. um, and you know, it's only a small leaf, isn't it? With, um, I was wondering if it might be something like to have KTP or something. Mm. You could, I mean, it would take a it would be great mm. to record. But it's not insurmountable, and I just mm. think it could be so exciting. Mm, especially, say, cheesy. And, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what fun. Unfilmable, that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like Gorman Gast. You've got the moving, you've got, them, you know, you've got the short stories, just turn them into something which is 3D. Mm. You've yes. got yeah. fantastic teaching to the yes. students. Yes. Particularly if it's a well-known case that they can relate well, you, to. Well, you know, you only need you only need to talk, you know take a couple of the biggest, uh, particularly the John the John Terry. I mean, any of the footballers, Frank, or whatever else yeah. that is. Um, but you know, the Max Mosley case. Yeah. You know, you can you can sex cells. Yeah. You know, mm. you can bring in the kind of and human rights law is so interesting and so dramatic yeah. because you know truth is stranger than fiction. Mm. So if you have them based on real cases, then you fictionalise them. Mm. So that the points of law are correct, mm. but the names have been changed for obvious reasons. Yeah, we do stress that that's essential. So no, I think it's a great way to get these cases across without yeah. having a defamation case. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They have. A, they put little disclaimers at the top yeah, of these stories. Of yes. This bears no relation to John Terry. Yeah. <laughs> and they are. Yeah, they are told that they can change the characters' names and they can change the facts of. You know, they can go off as long as it's based. As long as it's based on, on the on the yeah. facts of the case, yeah. they can include new scenarios and. Well, you know, Linda Laplante does it all the time, and she yeah. has fortune. You know, I don't see why you don't have a brilliant model there, yeah. and you can use it in higher education and see where else it goes. Mm. I can see Phil Redmond taking this, mm. the guy at Brookside, yeah. and uh, Paul Abbott, the guy who does um, blocking off and other things. <laughs> it's John, it's John Deed, but you know, or trial and retribution, isn't it? It's all of those. Mm. But it's based on real cases. I think there's a lot of... Conscious of the time, are there any more questions? I, I've got yeah. one point to make. Um, many years ago, I, I was involved in running group presentations, which involved many of the groups doing role plays. Uh -huh. And I hadn't until today really seen the link between the story writing, which causes written and individual, yes. and the group presentations which involved playlets, as it were, yes, the role story plays. Telling. And the major problem in law yeah. of the role plays, the area involved was generally the rights of children. But the, the major problem was, like the American musical, they stopped for the song, or rather in this case mm. stopped to explain what the law was in the middle of the role play. Oh, yes. And Steve's very usefully mm. identified how you get round that. <laughs> but also overcome the other major problem with the role play, which is students worrying about some dra dragging down their marks. Mm. Mm. So I think that there are issues, particularly when you raise it in the journalism context and the idea of performing arts, that we could try and mm. develop the links between the story writing, the mm. script as it were, and the performance, mm. and find ways of um, developing 
in an effective way across departments, not just mm -hmm. within law as well. And you know, for the legal concepts, you could turn those into soliloquies or something. Mm. Or the aside. Oh, that's yeah. Article 8, by the way, European Convention. I'm trying to do it, I'm trying to And then it continues. Yeah. Well, it, I would encourage them to actually supply a, a handout with the uh, appendix, as it were, the yes. documentary yes. backup. Yeah. R rather than interfering in the flow of mm. the play. You know, this would be great for distance learning as well. It's like a lecture in a games. You could build the materials and the thing could just be delivered by anyone in the student. If you had the right uh, supporting materials with it, you can use this in a number of different ways. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, thinking across how you use it, sort of the subjects, I mean, the way you use it, Stephen, is really interesting because you do use it as a way to get students to engage with primary source materials. Mm. Yes. So, immediately in history, because you, you said that's where it came Yes, from. yeah, yeah, one of my so histories. I'm sure there's other subjects oh, yeah. where you can, it's a way of getting students engaged, mm. but also in terms of the threshold concepts, to try and get students to write a story around a particular threshold concept. Well, so I'm thinking of, in my background, economics, so you could do opportunity cost, you could write a short story mm. based around that concept of opportunity cost. So, the potential is mm -hmm. Yes, we've had, we've had a lot of interest. Notes, mm -hmm. it? Yeah. 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 Yes. I've had interest from um, the politics, um, yeah. uh, science, uh, bi biology. <laughs> um, what else? The so sociology. Mm. Yes. I mean, there are a lot of subjects there where students can explore. Um, certain concepts. I mean, politics would be a great one as well. Philosophy. Yeah. Philosophy. Yeah. Yes. It's, it is very interesting. I wish more people would take it up, really. I mean, initially you do have to, um, I do have to put a bit of time into it. Which is why we don't. Which is, yeah, the, the, and of course time has been whisked away need, in the you last few years. You need to train us all in creative writing techniques <laughs> so that we can all take it up. But, but quite frankly, no. these students, they grasp yeah. the concept really quickly. They, they all know about I mean, they read novels. Mm. So, the, the, you know, they were dying to try it out. Mm. Can I just ask, applying the ointment, at the lower end of the scale, us weaker students just giving you a completely relevant story out of the top of their head? I think they decide quite early on whether it's for them or not and a lot of them would say there's no way I'm going to do that, I'm okay. not fussy on, on reading. So you don't uh, have the week as you think it's easy and they, they can't Occasionally cope. we yeah. will, occasionally, yeah. particularly with the first years they get a uh, hold of the wrong end of the stick and they, they so the don't write a story, they just write a, a news report about something so they mm. can com go completely off, off kilter. But generally uh, they're They've got the sk they've got the skills and the motivation to do it, so they've got this, you know, the the bones, the bare bones that are there, and, and then they um, show us drafts and the, you know they enhance the work, etc. So that's quite interesting because if you set a, an essay to a hundred students, a good ten percent will answer a different question. A good ten percent, sometimes it's twenty percent, etc. Uh, whereas there's less of that with the short story, perhaps because we give them more tuition and guidance, uh, and we give them examples of how it's going to be done. But as I say, very rarely will they just sort of copy the example, although first years are prone to do that a little bit. A focus on yeah. the final. Last two, and then we need to All right. Go. Focus on the final semester of the final year mm. means that there's limited development or yeah. linkages. So taking Paul's idea of a course focus. I would suggest that we should be thinking about how the concepts <coughs> and perhaps initial work could be introduced at an earlier stage, mm. even if the final stage of which assessment is going to take place mm. would be in the final semester of the final year. Mm. Well, they cross forward. I wondered if actually if it would be better as a long skinny, starting with one, finishing with 24, um, you know, and, and then going back to the teacher across in two hours per week instead of four hours. Mm. If you did it as long as skinny, you've got that 
But I wanted to ask actually about the criteria. Um, there's two sets of criteria here in a way. There's the legal criteria, yeah. and then there's a the short story of creativity and the, you know the, the, the junctions you need to hit those. And uh, presumably you do all the marketing for this stuff. You I do you? now, yeah. I mean because that's so presumably because then that's that's kind of like asking the students to also be good at creative writing. Yeah. Which they may say, well that's not what I say. Mm -hmm. Well so I we well, do say it's not about yeah. the creative writing, but, but it's about the law. You're going to have to reward good creative writing. Yeah. You? Well, we say to the students in, in week one that you're, you're on a, a law course and you're on an English course. You might not have signed up for an English course, but you are on an English course because as a, as a lawyer, you've got to use English properly, etc. So it's just a sort of elaboration uh, of that. Um, initially, Alison came in with the criteria and she would oversee the, um, the drafting process and some of the marking to make sure that yeah, these were proper stories. I think I've got it now so I tend to combine both although occasionally I'll, I'll pass one over to her but principally I say to them I want uh, obviously for you to show me that you've appreciated and understood the, the case and the legal aspects etc but I want you to write an interesting and readable story but including all the skills I taught you in the first year about academic writing in law generally mm -hmm. and that's clarity. One difficulty of course is that uh, you tell them in the first year never write in the vernacular and then you get them to write a short story where most of the characters talk in the vernacular and they, they're worried about well can I do that, can I put apostrophes and all, you know, all this in. I <coughs> said so, well you, you report it as people would speak but uh, obviously you as the narrator would then resume a more formal style etc so that's quite tricky uh, but very beneficial I think because they can then see when it's appropriate to talk formally and when it's uh, appropriate to, to report in the vernacular because no he's getting some somebody from a council estate to be talking as if they're the Lord Chief Justice well, yeah. 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 okay I think we need to thank Alison and Stephen again now the Mondrian poster there, very stylish Mondrian style poster. Uh, the content of it is online. Anybody interested in knowing more, I'll send you the link. Because this poster I had to present in Dublin because Alison was busy in another conference. So I presented it as a threshold concept in conference in Dublin two years ago for Alison. And uh, is there online, the, the abstract is online if you're interested. If you're interested in threshold concepts, and creative writing together as well, because I might use some of it for my masters now. Yes, think please. About. They really struggle, the overseas students, with re reflecting on being a reflective teacher. Really tough. The, the captaincy so, adjourned with a court case. Yeah, they did. They, they, did. they, did. they didn't get an injunction to stop the photographs, but, but they, they did, did get. They got, they, did some off, they got some damages. They got some damages in the end. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't a great, wasn't a great deal. deal. Yeah, it wasn't a great and it was deal. It's almost like kind of. Almost a judge saying, oh, can I also thank Tim for filming for me because Dean Buffin couldn't come. So thanks a lot, Tim. My so pleasure. For so, so the last you time. <laughs> <laughs> you will do yourself. If you teach me how to use that, I'll do you and Alison next time.